I'll invite you guys to come on in and find a seat. Very glad to see all of you. Welcome to midweek. And I think we've been in this arrangement long enough that it's sort of like in the auditorium. I kind of know where everybody sits because we sort of gravitate to the same chairs each time. So we're, we're glad you're back and you claim your spot. And if, if you get tired of sitting in the back, there are plenty up here. So just, uh, just make yourself at home. Um, Last week, uh, we, we had the, the benefit of having Dale Manor here, uh, and at the end of that session, I guess the take-home piece was that, of that was um, how important it is for us to introduce the Bible, Scripture, at home early on so that uh, our children grow up with that and that there is an awareness from the very beginning that the origin of what's right, what's wrong, where the absolutes really uh, emanate from, come from Scripture. Uh, so he, he sort of took us uh, in a, a very broad way, but I, I think if we had to put it together, that, that's the important part of that. If we roll back two weeks ago, where we sort of left off as we were beginning uh, this uh, part of the series, we talked about the importance of envisioning family. And you'll remember, just a quick refresher if you, in case you weren't here, we looked at the text where Gabriel, God's messenger, his representative, uh, made uh, contact with Mary, brought her the news that obviously she wasn't expecting at the time about uh, her selection to be the mother of the Son of God and how that conversation unfolded uh, as, as it went along. And you know, at the end of the presentation tonight, just as we've done each time before, there'll be the last slide will have an email address on it, which is uh, an invitation for you to, to sort of interact. If you have a thought, if you have a comment, if you have an insight, something that you'd like to share, uh, feel free to add that. So I want to just introduce one of the comments that came as a result of that two weeks ago. And by the way, welcome to those of you who are online. Um, Brother uh, Clarence and Sister Patty Wilson are very um, attendant. Uh, they're here every online, every Wednesday night. Uh, and so after the last session, uh, Patty wrote to me uh, a, a little insight that I thought was worth sharing, and I asked her permission to do that tonight. She told me that she was in Israel last spring uh, on a tour, and uh, on one of the days, their tour guide, who was a Palestinian Christian, uh, talked to them a little bit about the text that we looked at two weeks ago. And the comment was that in Aramaic, and by the way, Patty says she's not been able to confirm this, so if you're a linguist with a background in the Aramaic language, feel free to correct us or add to this. But she said the, the tour guide told her, or told them, that there are two greetings in Aramaic. One is a very casual, hi, how are you, and, and on by with no expectation of interaction. But the second one is more, uh, and I don't know that we would say formal, but it, it's more relational. And it would go something like, hello, we need to have a conversation. I have something I need to tell you. Um, and so this was more of the, the feeling that we really should get, I think, based on what she was telling me from that interaction. Because the verse after the initial greeting says, you know, she was a little troubled about what was being said. She wasn't sure what this greeting meant. So if that is true, that there are options for how you greet, this may have been the second greeting that says, we need to talk. And so she's on alert at that point. And we know as we worked through that before, by the end of that conversation, even though she had heard all of this that just seemed beyond belief at the time, she understood that this message came from God and she was all in. That's a lot. 
to ask of a, a young girl who's engaged, not married, who's just been told that she will conceive the Son of God. But it doesn't stop there in many ways. She becomes the example of what it is to be all in to parent. Because even as soon as she knew that this was going to happen, that wasn't the end of the road for her. We don't know much about Joseph, what happened to him, although we'll look at that next week. We know that she stayed with Jesus through his whole life on earth. She was very much a part of that. You know, if you think back on it, she's the one who nudged him to launch his mission at the wedding feast in Canaan, and there where the first miracle comes. And she's with him. She follows him all the way through, and she's with him in the end. So when she gets this news, she's all in, and she understands her responsibility as a mother, as a parent at that time. So, Patty, if you're watching tonight, thank you for that uh, little bit of extra there. I think it adds some dimension to what we talked about, and it, and it really gives us a depth about the responsibility of parenting that, that shows up, that comes to us long before a baby does. That that whole importance of envisioning what family is supposed to look like uh, and how we get ready to do that. Okay, um, let's go along here and get started for tonight. I don't usually think of Fred Astaire as being a deep philosopher, but I came across this quotation this week, which says, old age is like everything else. To make a success of it, you have to start early. And uh, I think as you know, we sort of think about that and we, th we think about the whole beginning of our life. The, the first and earliest references that we have about the birthing process we get from the, the opening pages of Scripture in Genesis chapter 1. At the end of the creation week, God has summarized everything that happens, and he has made man. And we get the details of that creation later on, but at the end of that, these are the words that he says, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. Okay, so that's the imperative that's laid out there right at the beginning. So I don't know what the design actually was in the beginning. You know, how, how was that population supposed to take place? How, how was all of that going to go? However it was supposed to go, it changed. Because in the, the garden, when the choices were made that didn't go so well, God passes out the disciplines and nobody was left out. Satan gets his due first. And then Adam finds out that, you know, he's going to take care of his family, but in order to do that, the earth is going to work against him. It's not in his favor anymore. It's going to be tedious to do that. But it's Eve who gets the discipline of the internal part of the family. From that point on, there's a tension between husband and wife, and now there is pain associated with childbearing. Now the implication to me is that there wasn't pain associated with childbearing before if the process even was the same. So whatever happened, there was a modification at that point and pain became a part of it. The, uh, since that time, there have been unbelievable advances in obstetrics and in neonatal pediatrics. You know, we've, uh, we have all kinds of things that protect pregnancy or make pregnancy more viable from early on, uh, from uh, ultrasound to fetal monitoring during labor and delivery, the NICU that, that's ready for the preemies, uh, you know, afterwards, epidurals. Uh, which were unheard of uh, 20 or 30 years ago, have become the thing uh, to mitigate pain of uh, uh, labor and delivery. But at the end of the day, whenever you consider all of those things, the natural process of childbirth is still the same. It was put in place by God, and it's been repeated millions of times. It's very familiar. The circumstances are different. Sometimes we deliver at home, sometimes we deliver in the car, sometimes we deliver in the parking lot, sometimes we make it to the hospital, which is most of the time. We're thankful when that happens. 
the process is the same, it's just the circumstances are different each time. Now, some of you are not going to believe this. You're too young. Others of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. There was a time when dads or families were not allowed in the delivery room. That hasn't been so terribly long ago, except this is a black and white picture, which tells you that it's been long enough for that to have happened. But it, it would be, I mean, it would all come down to the fact that at the, the doors, usually the big swinging doors, husbands would say goodbye to their wives who would be taken off to the labor and delivery suite, and they would go to the waiting room and hang out and hang out and hang out and wait and wonder, you know, what's going on? How long is this going to take? When will this be over? Well, you know, what, what's the story uh, back there? And then finally the doors would swing open and the doc would walk out and you realize this, this could be the waiting room right here because you all would have somebody back there laboring at the same time. So we have all these families that suddenly create this community, you know, waiting for, for babies. So when the doc walks through, all heads turn, wondering, is this the news for me? And there's this moment before any words are spoken where everybody looks for, is there any body language? Is this going to be good news? Is this going to be bad news? You know, what, what's coming? And then the words are spoken. You have a healthy baby boy, healthy girl. Uh, mom and baby are doing well. Uh, the baby's getting cleaned up and warmed up. We'll be in the nursery in just a few minutes. You can go over there. Uh, they'll pull the curtains back and you'll see the baby for the first time and congratulations. And then the doc turns around and walks away. And that's kind of the interaction there, uh, or it used to be a long time ago. And so there's this collective sigh of relief. Everybody, even if it's not your wife or mother or whoever's back there delivering, there's this collective sigh of relief that everything has gone well you know, at that point. And then there's this herd movement, because even if it's not your baby, you kind of want to see what the baby looks like. So everybody gets up and goes to the nursery and looks in the window, and maybe the nurse is holding the baby, maybe the baby's in the bassinet. But we hear, you start hearing all these oohs and ahs, and oh, it looks just like, or she looks just like, or, or whatever's going on. And, you know, if it's a really ramped up crowd, you know, they break into the hallelujah chorus and all these things that go down to, to celebrate, you know, what has, has just happened. And then the, after this goes on for a minute, there's this dispersion. Now, in the old days, you had to have a pocket full of quarters, and it was a race to the payphone because there are people who are out there waiting to know. You know, they, they need it now. For you guys, it's a snapshot uh, with your phone through the window, and then you're texting and you're posting, and within seconds, everybody knows everything that you know about what has just happened, including the statistics for the weight and the length of the baby, which I think is really more of a tribute to mom probably than it is the baby cares anything about that. But nevertheless, we always say that, we always post that, and everybody feels good about it or doesn't feel good about it, whatever that it emotes whenever you hear the, uh, those statistics. And then before long, people start showing up. And for you moms, you know it's that little knock on the door and is the baby in here and is it okay to come in and you know just kind of want to see what's going on and then you'll see this pink or blue or pink and blue uh, wreath or bow or ribbon show up on the door and this is all just sort of evolving but somewhere in that room there'll be a book most of the time it's a baby book because moms start collecting these memories early on. Now, it may be the, the wristband that the baby has on, or it may be something from the state, but, but things start going into this book that um, uh, are going to um, sort of tell the story as time goes on. This is actually a, a verse that's sort of taken out of context in the sense that Jesus used it as a metaphor when he was trying to explain some other things to his disciples. But it describes sort of the culmination of this event. You know the verse, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy. 
that a child is born into the world. So all of that, it took me all of that to say that in just a matter of seconds, we go from this angst to this joy, this ecstasy of, of what it is to have this baby in your arms. Now, that little generic scenario is very familiar to an event about 2,000 years ago. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn, Danny's going to read for us again tonight just in case you don't have them. And this will get us all on the same page here at the same time. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. And I'm reading from the easy-to-read version. That night, some shepherds were in the fields. They were watching their sheep. An angel of the Lord God stood before the shepherds. The glory of the Lord was shining round about them. The shepherds became very afraid. The angel said to them, Don't be afraid, because I am telling you some good news. It will make all the people very happy. Today, your Savior was born in David's town. He is Christ the Lord. This is how you will know him. You'll find a baby wrapped in pieces of cloth and lying in a feeding box. Then a very large group of angels from heaven joined the first angel. All the angels were praising God, saying, Give glory to God in heaven and on earth. Let there be peace to the people that please God. The angels left the shepherds and went back to heaven. The shepherds said to each other, We will go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. We will see this thing the Lord God told us about. So, shepherds, so the shepherds went quickly and found Mary and Joseph. The baby was lying in the feeding box. The shepherds saw the baby. Then they told what the angels had said about this child. Everyone was surprised when they heard what the shepherds told them. Mary hid these things in her heart. She continued to think about them. The shepherds went back to their sheep, praising God and thanking him for everything that they had seen and heard. It was just as the angel had told them. Thank you, Danny. Well, if we are preparing our children, if we're teaching them well, what is it that we should teach them about birth? I know that there's this sort of angst and sort of feeling of awkwardness when you start talking about the talk, or as we used to say in black and white pictures, the birds and the bees back then. It reminds me of the story of the little boy who eased up to his dad and he said, Dad, can you tell me where I came from? Of course, the dad broke out in a sweat because he wasn't prepared at that point and he pulled himself together and He's tried to offer age-appropriate information, and the little boy listened, and he finally said, well, that's very interesting, Dad, but Johnny told me he came from Michigan. And uh, so I think the point is, you know, we want to be sure that we're answering the question that we're being asked, but this is not about the discussion, or this discussion is not about tonight how conception occurs. It's about the value of conception when it occurs. Okay, so I want to make that distinction really clear here as we begin. The overwhelming, I think, principle that Danny just read, if we extract that and try to boil that down, is that we have reasons to celebrate life. And we're going to tear that apart here and kind of dissect it and look at why. But that text tells us, and, I, and I'll try to hope to, to uh, help you believe that, that we have reasons to celebrate life really in more than one way. I want to begin with a, a story from about um, 35 plus years ago. Um, Elaine and I were in a, sitting in a delivery room at the time. It was our third time there. 
um, waiting for the birth of our daughter, third child. Um, and it was one of those times, it was in the afternoon, but the fetal monitor was just blub, 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 that reassuring sound of heartbeat. It's rhythmic, it's almost hypnotizing to listen to it. But as long as you're hearing it, you know things are going well with that. And every beat, every minute that passed, we knew we were that much closer to this child, you know, being in our arms at that point. Two doors down in the hallway, there was another mother who was laboring. But it was a, a different situation there because there was silence in her room. And the, the only repetitive sound was her questioning, her speaking, sometimes to herself, sometimes to the nurse who was helping her. But it was this repeated question, what did I do? Why my baby? Again and again. Why after nine months, and that's the question that we're left with at times, of wanting and waiting that child for that child, should her baby be denied life outside the womb? Because the uterus that had supported the development of this child now had, in a sense, become the coffin. And no one could answer her questions. Hours later, we passed in the hallway. One of us was being charged with the responsibility to go home and teach our child well. The other was being discharged to bury that responsibility alongside part of themselves. And so the question that still is unanswered is, which baby was more valuable? Why was one taken? Why was the other spared? The value of every life is not determined by whether a baby arrives safely outside the womb. The value is not determined by whether that baby lives a few seconds or lives a hundred years. The value begins at the moment of conception. Regardless of how long we have life, we have value, and I think that's exciting news. Because once life is conceived, it never ends. The value is forever. We'll, we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But if we're going to teach our children well, we're, we need to teach them how to celebrate conception. Sometimes um, at delivery, when a baby's a little sluggish, a physician or a nurse will thump their feet a little bit just to stimulate them to cry, take those first deep breaths, you know, to, to get things going. But God actually switched on life a long time before that, you know, nine months earlier, because the minute the fusion takes place between sperm and egg, God breathes life into that soul. I'm about to show you what I think is the most important slide that I'm going to put up tonight. We'll, we'll move on. But I, I really want you to soak up this one coming in. In that moment of conception, we become eternal. Our soul, from that point on, lives forever. It doesn't matter what happens after that. We live forever. It's an aha moment, for me it was, to wake up in the middle of the night in a sweat and to realize that death only changes our existence on earth. It doesn't snuff out our soul. It doesn't erase our identity. It, it doesn't uh, eliminate our value. Our life may drop out of sight in the vision of those people who are sitting around us, but we don't drop out of eternity. The destiny is the same for all of us. We live and we die. And while we live, we have the 
opportunity to choose our destination. And so that when we rise, we live forever our choice. I think that's why making the choice of destination while we can is so important. It's why it's so important that we teach our children well and we get started early in life. So every life, whether it's long or short, painful or pleasant, good or bad, it deserves to be celebrated, every life. We may not be able to hold that life in our arms. Emotionally, that's devastating when it happens, when a pregnancy is ended by circumstances that are beyond our control. And I realize, even as I'm saying this, that some of you may have had children who did not survive the pregnancy. And my heart breaks for you because I know you would very much like to have the opportunity to teach your children well. I know that. But I want you to hear me say it. I think this is critically important, that you still gave them the golden ticket. You did. At conception, even though they're not here in your arms, they have the guarantee of being in the presence of the Creator who knit them together. Their value is not diminished just because we didn't get to enjoy their presence. That's, that's important to know that that value was not lost. So, we want to teach our children to understand the value of life begins the moment of conception. We need to teach them to celebrate birth, not just conception, but birth and birthdays, which they don't have any trouble with usually, uh, and we don't either whenever we uh, really get into it. I read something this last week that talks about milestones, birthdays that are milestones. If we had time, I'd let you guess what they are, but I'll just tell you. Year one, year 16, year 18, year 21, year 30, and then every 10 years after that, as long as you can pile them up. You know, a birthday marks the year that's just finished. Sometimes we think of it as, oh, a commencement for the coming year, but it's really the one we just completed. Um, and I, again, learned a little something, again, by looking through some quotations uh, of what Eleanor Roosevelt said, which I believe is, is probably as accurate as anything, and that is, today is the oldest that I've ever been and the youngest that I'll ever be again. And so for those of you who, like me, are on, sort of on the back end of all of this, every birthday is a milestone. Uh, so that, that list may be important on the front end of life, but not so much on the back end. So if we have time, we'll come back to this later, but in case we don't, I just want you to think about it. Think about the very best birthday celebration that you've been a part of. Okay, now you don't have to tell me, just think about it. And then why? Why was it? Why was it the best? I'll tell you mine real quickly. 21 and 60. They were both surprise parties. It's pretty hard to surprise me. But people showed up who I had, didn't expect. And that was a memorable occasion. But just kind of roll that around a little bit. What birthday is the most memorable to you? Well, we want to make the most, most of birthdays for our kids. And I, so I'm giving you an acronym tonight, nothing really spectacular about this, you know it already. But I do better if I have something visual to um, look at. Now that rave is not the rave that you may be thinking about where it's the disco with the loud electronic music and the drugs and it's uh, Woodstock in a small space on steroids kind of thing. Not that kind of rave, but a birthday that celebrates them. And there are things that if we're looking back on a year as the, the year that we're celebrating, what should we include? Well, it's a great time to reflect. You know, as you look back on that, what's happened this last year? And what needs to happen, you know, going forward? 
it's a great opportunity for affirmation. You know, what's, what happened physically, growth and development? And, uh, and what do we expect in the year coming up? What about the vision? It's a great time to go back and remember, oh yeah, we said this is kind of where we wanted to be. Is, we're on, is, is that where we are? Uh, have we made it that far? It's also a great time to start identifying the strengths in our children. What are their aptitudes? What are their skills? What are their natural inclinations? How do we um, you know, enhance that? What are some traits that maybe we want to channel in a little different direction? It's a great opportunity to take a look. And then expectation. You know, and I'm saying expectation as a two-edged sword. We're really quick to lay out expectations for our children. But what expectations should we have of ourselves? Is it time for us to get out of the helicopter? You know, is it time to let choice and consequence become the teacher? Where are we, you know, in this timeline of milestone birthdays that may make a difference with that? So... That's uh, rave for whatever, uh, however you would say it. You would do it in probably other terms and words. I just happened to look for things that made it work out where it would spell that. So, uh, again, uh, we want to celebrate birth and birthdays, okay? So, if we celebrate conception, we celebrate birthdays, we also want to celebrate uniqueness, life of uniqueness. In this text that Danny read for us, the messenger, God's representative, comes, but it wasn't this, uh, you know, you guys already know about all this. You knew this was going to have it's no big deal. He, he's here, so y'all get on with life. This messenger was ecstatic. I mean, go back and read the text again when you have time. Good news. Great joy. I mean, this is, we're all in on this. This is a, a, a big deal. There's never been a baby like this before. This is the Christ. There's a level of excitement, you know, that, that is part of this message here. And part of it is because this baby was unique. But then every baby is unique. Individual aspects of each one of us is the gift that God gives us when he knits us together. Psalm 139, which we often go to when we talk about things like this, if you go back and read portions of that, these are, are things that come out of there. He created my innermost being. He created my innermost being. That uniqueness that makes me who I am. He's the one who knit me together. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. No one is exactly like me. Probably good. And I am unique in, in every way that God wants me to be unique. And that, that is possible because the genetic traits that come with the fusion of egg and sperm have countless possibilities for combinations. So there's always a guarantee of uniqueness in that. And if you don't believe that, just look at families who have lots of children. Okay? They may look similarly in some ways, but boy... Personalities are different, skill sets are different, talents are different. We're all different uh, in that situation of being unique. Aristotle is, is credited with saying that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's always intrigued me. Um, and as I was thinking about it this week, if all of the parts are the same, the sum of the parts is the sum of the parts. It's pretty mundane, it's pretty boring. You know, there's, you don't get much out of that. But if the parts are unique, something very different happens. You remember the little scene in Apollo 13 where the spaceship is stranded and they're trying to figure out how to get it home? And the lead engineer comes in and he dumps that box out on the table and everybody, he said, look, this is what they've got on board. You all figured out, you've got to get them home. Every one of those little pieces was different and what they wound up doing with them was making them do something that nobody thought they could do when they put them all together. It, it turned into something, a solution, that was bigger than what anybody thought could, could take place. 
But when you put the parts that are distinctly different together, you start getting something. You get this grinding noise where edges start grating against each other, and you get this wetting sound of iron sharpening iron, and, and you smell the heat of a weld, and you, you feel the tension of a bend. But at the end, when all those parts have been put together, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So the unique individual aspect of each one of us when we've contributed something really can make that happen. God equipped us to be unique. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. And that's what our children need to know. They need to understand that stars shine the brightest on the darkest night. And so there, there's no question. They're already facing the darkness of perverse culture. And unless something happens, it, it seems to be getting darker and darker as time goes on. But it's our responsibility to teach them to embrace the fact that they have something unique to offer and we need to prepare them to do that all right so they celebrate uniqueness we want to celebrate lives of others now i, I borrowed this from for those of you who were sunday this was in jordan's presentation so i just tweaked it a little bit but i want to want us to walk through this because in order to teach our children and students and players to celebrate the lives of others, we're going to have to lead the hike up the mountain. Okay? So this is about us as much as it is them. So, based on what he told us on Sunday, if we're going to celebrate the lives of others, we have to believe that God loves us. That, that's a pill we can swallow pretty easy, isn't it? John 3.16, he says, I mean, basically, Scripture says, he loves us enough to do what he did, to send his son to die for us. Okay, so we can buy into that. All right, so we'll scale a little more. All right, because God values me, you, then I should love myself. You should love yourself. Just because I made a mistake, I am not damaged goods thrown out on the garbage heap. Okay, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am uniquely created. God values me. Therefore, I can be okay with that. I can value me. All right? Move on up. Because God values every person, I need to love others like I love myself. Okay? God loves me. I can love myself. I know what that feels like. Now, I can love others. And the reason I can do that is because God has value in them just like he does in me. We okay so far? Making it up the mountain, all right. All right, we make another little step. Now, need to love others more than me. Okay, now, we're all valued, but the push is love others more than me. And then to make the final ascent, can I love my enemies? Paul gives us a list of imperatives in Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge. Oof, it's a tough list. How do you do that with people who berate you, who bully you, who cancel you? How do you do that? So here's, here's your question. Where do you think we land mostly on the mountain. How far up to the mountain do you think we usually can get before we kind of pitch our tent? We don't have to answer that. I, my prediction is we're okay with God loves you. We're okay with I can love myself because God loves me. We're even okay with I can love other people like I love myself. It's hard to strike camp beyond that. Kind of gets stuck right about that point, and the slope gets pretty steep, and whether we can get on up the mountain 
is a, is a pretty tough challenge. But if we're going to teach our kids to do that, we've got to give them a why that's powerful enough to motivate them and us to make that final climb. Victor Frankel, who Bruce McClarty introduced us to many years ago, for those of you who were here, this book, Man's Search for Meaning, you remember Frankel was a psychiatrist who was incarcerated in Auschwitz uh, during World War II, watched every horrible thing that man can do to his fellow man. And at the end of it, he wrote this book to sort of chronicle what he'd seen and to, to theorize on what should be done. And he quotes Nietzsche with this quotation that says, he who has a why, a why to live, can bear most any how. From a prisoner's perspective, I get locked up in this concentration camp. And I look around, and it looks like there's no hope for getting out. I don't know whether I can hang on or not until I have a why. And if my why is that I want to live long enough to be reunited to my family, that is a powerful why that lets me endure horrible things if I think that's a possibility. So we, gotta, we have to have a powerful why to motivate us to get on up that mountain. How do we do that? Well, I think we have an example. God gave his son a why that was incredibly powerful. And I, I'm putting together a conversation that didn't exist that I know of, but it, I think it could have. He says, you know, you're going to be the savior of the world. You be the savior of the world. That's an imperative. Now, what do I do with that? I'm going to tell you because otherwise the world is lost for eternity. Okay, it's up to you. That, that's, your, that's your task. That's your mission. But here's why. Because if you don't do it, here's what's going to happen. The creation needs an advocate. Our people down there, they need an advocate. They need someone to do something for them that they cannot do for themselves. And since they will all live forever, you've got to show them how to choose the destination that brings them home to us. Whew, that's a big why. It's a big why. There's a lot of motivation to climb that mountain on that. At age 12, elementary school, he says to his folks, I need to be about my father's business. He got it. He had the vision. He set his eyes on the purpose. And so when he stepped out into that mission, he crossed social boundaries. He ate with the outcasts. He touched lepers. He advocated for what is right for all people for all times, in all places. He had a why. He had a big why. And so we need to teach our folks, our kids, that folks on the margin need us to advocate for them. We're going to run out of time, I think, but I was going to ask you to do this, to list the groups of folks who need us to be their advocate the folks that we need to teach our children to be alert to and aware of, how do we advocate for them? I think you would have come up with a list, probably what I would, would do, so I'll just run through it. Unborn children need an advocate. The elderly, which is one year older than whatever age I am, you know, whoever that may be. The elderly need an advocate. Those who are challenged physically or mentally need an advocate. The folks who Jesus listed in Matthew 25 need an advocate. Those who are hungry, those who are thirsty, those who are lonely, who are destitute, who are in prison. There are lots of folks who need an advocate. And if we intentionally celebrate, when we intentionally celebrate the lives of others, we do it because every life is valued by God. Okay. And then the very last one 
is that we need to teach our children to celebrate the life of Jesus himself. You know, the divine family at his birth showed up. I mean, they came in droves and in masses, and they weren't quiet about it when they got there. The shepherds showed up. They were excited. They spread the news. Sometime later, the magi showed up. The kings from the east who had a baby shower, who brought their gifts, had a sip and see. Isn't that what you call it? You know, when you come later on and you see the baby and you do all of that. And so Jesus thrives on all of this. And then at the end of his life, on his journey into Jerusalem, the crowds line up again. And they celebrate him for all the things that he did, all the people that he touched, and all the differences that he made. And then it comes to us, all these years later, every Sunday... We get to do the same thing. We get to celebrate his entire life, his birth, his mission, his death, his resurrection, the promise of him coming again. It's the whole story. We get to do it every Sunday. He showed us, I think, and this is the example we need to hold up for our children, that there is power in a single life. A single, in each one of us here, there's power in us doing what we can do. And that is worth celebrating. There's power in one kind word, in one sh hand on a shoulder, in one pause when we were interrupted to just listen. One, it, it's not the loneliest number, if you go back to songs from years ago, it's, it's the powerful number that we have to deal with. Uh, one Solitary Life, I won't read that. You remember the essay James Francis wrote talking about the difference that Jesus made. But here's the conclusion. The father emphasized for his son that he needed to celebrate every life, that he needed to celebrate uniqueness in each life. He needed to bring all of us home if we'll choose to go and to remind us that forever is a long time to go uncelebrated. So, if we teach our children that they are valuable because God values them, that they can be unique contributors to God's kingdom by being followers who inspire followers. Now, this is a takeoff on the college class, disciples making disciples, which is the beginning point, but followers who inspire followers to become disciples who make disciples is another power of one. If we teach them that they, they're going to live forever, if we teach them that their choices will determine their destination, and if we teach them that they should value others because God desires no one to be lost, then we've taught them well. We taught them to celebrate life, just like God taught his son to do the same thing. I think our goal, really, is to teach them well about birth so that they will choose to be born again. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you being here, being part of this midweek family community. We just want it to continue to grow, and I hope this helps us finish the week strong. So we'll see you next week.